So welcome to lecture series 11, which will cover memory. And according to cognitive psychologists, there are generally three stages of memory. First stage is sensory memory. Some of that information gets passed on to short-term memory, and a bit of that information gets passed on to long-term memory. And once you get to long-term memory, you can talk about the difference between conscious and unconscious memories. You can talk about amnesia or difficulty remembering. And we're also going to talk about at the end of this series, those aspects of research on memory that pertain to students and how they can have the most successful study sessions in the least amount of time. The three stages of memory according to the classic three box model. Uh, the first one is sensory memory. Each of your sensory systems, so your ears, your eyes, your nose, your fingers, uh, they all have a very brief store called sensory memory. It can hold quite a bit of information for a very short amount of time, half a second, maybe for tactile stimulation up to two or three seconds. And what sensory memory allows us to do is experience the world as continuous, right? Some memory for what just happened so you can make sense of what's happening now. Short-term memory holds somewhere between five and nine meaningful units of information. Usually it's described as seven plus or minus two. So let's say about seven things. And it can hold that information for about 15 seconds. And then long-term memory as far as we know, can hold a near infinite amount of information. And as far as we know, it holds it for your whole life. Because there's this question, of course we forget all the time, but does forgetting mean that the information that was stored in your brain is gone? Or does it mean that that information is lost? Hmm. So let's start with sensory memory. Uh, if you've ever played with sparklers, you know something about sensory memory. So a sparkler is, you know, a um, basically a stick with a little point of light on the end. And if you're a kid and you're playing with sparklers, you can swirl them around in circles like this, like the girl is doing, and that you can write with them. So the circle, you can see a circle. What's interesting is we see a circle. We assume that somehow the light is actually present in all the locations of the circle, but it isn't. There's only a point of light. The trail that we see is our sensory memory. It's our memory for where the point of light had just been. That's why, uh, for example, lightning looks like lines. It's also why we can go to movies and see, we know that movies come from film, and we know that film is a series of static pictures. One picture is shown every, I think like 24 pictures in a second, something like that. But we know they're static pictures. But when you go to the movie, uh, when you go to the movies someday, um, those, you don't see a series of stationary pictures. It's not like flipping through a book. You see movement. And that's a result of sensory memory. Now, how much can it hold? Well, we have a pretty good idea, thanks to the research of Professor George Sperling, who's now down the road at the University of California at Irvine. And what Professor Sperling did was to show people arrays or grids of different letters. And he'd show them these letters very, very briefly, just for a fraction of a second take them away and ask people, okay, how many of the letters do you remember? This procedure that he used, and we're gonna talk about three procedures that Professor Sperling used. The procedure that George used, um, uh, this one is called whole report procedure. Uh, subjects were asked to uh, report everything that they saw. So whole report. And what Sperling found from the whole report procedure is that people could remember mm, about four or five things. So um, this is what the whole report procedure looked like. There you can see the grid of nine letters. And he would show these to people super brief. You'd see the grid, and immediately the moment he would take the grid away, he'd ask, OK, tell me what you saw. And people, on average, would remember hmm, four or five things. Okay. 
Now, the way for you to remember the whole report procedure is to participate with me in a demonstration of the whole report procedure. Now, the students in my class, I need you to understand that your ability to remember things is a function of the memory that those things have for you, which is a function of whether you've worked with the material before. So I, I strongly urge my students to participate in the demonstrations that uh, I'm going to show. Otherwise, this video will be excruciatingly, excruciatingly boring and you won't learn anything. Okay, so what I'm going to do is very briefly flash a grid and then I'm going to ask you, once I take the grid away, what did you see? Okay, you ready? So, go. Boom. What letters do you remember? Say them out loud. Okay, this was the grid. How many did you remember? One, two, three, four, five, something like that? Good. So using the whole report procedure, it looks as if sensory memory can hold eh, about four items. Okay. But Sperling changed his methodology and came up with a new measure that you'll see resulted in a different conclusion. So we're not going to stick with the sensory memory only holds four bits of information. You're going to see something different. Okay. This new method that he used is called the partial report procedure. And what the partial report procedure consists of is the following. Again, you get a grid. Again, it's presented super quickly, 50 milliseconds. But the moment it goes away, you hear a, a tone is played. And either the tone uh, tells you that you should report all the letters in the top row of the grid, or a different tone tells you that you should report all the letters in the medium middle row of the grid, or a different tone tells you to report all the letters in the bottom row of the grid. And what Sperling found when he did this is that people could remember all the letters. Ah, interesting. So Sperling argued that sensory memory has a much bigger capacity than the three, four, or five items that you would assume um, reflected the sensory memory capacity based on the whole report procedure. But let's, um, let's do this example, the partial report procedure. We'll do an example of it. So in this example, I'm going to show you a grid very quickly and then I'll yell out very quickly, top, middle, or bottom. And I want you, after you hear the word, I want you to report what letters do you remember from the top of the grid, or if I say bottom, what letters did you remember from the bottom grid? Or if I say middle, then report the middle grid. Okay, you ready? Here's 50 milliseconds display. Here we go. Top. Did you remember them all? All the letters in the top row? Overall, people remember more letters in the partial report procedure than in the whole report procedure. And why is that? Well, in the whole report procedure, it takes time for you to get all the letters out of your mouth. And sensory memory is so brief that the time it takes you to say the letters, the time while you're saying the letters, your visual image or your visual memory is disappearing. It's like you can't respond fast enough. So with a partial report procedure, you just have to uh, report a few of the letters and then that percentage, the percentage that you can remember from each row, gives us an estimate of how much people can remember. And when you use a partial report procedure, it sure looks like the capacity for sensory memory is very, very large. All right, let's do another example of it. I'll show you a grid and then I'll yell out top, middle, or bottom. And you tell me what letters do you remember from the top row or the bottom row or the middle row. Okay, here we go. You ready? Three, two, one. Bottom. How many did you get right? Okay. What the partial report procedure gives you is time enough to report all the letters in the row. Now, if you knew all the letters in one row and you didn't know what row I was going to ask for, that means that you had availability of visual memory in each of the rows. So the capacity of sensory memory is very, very large according to the partial report procedure. 
Now we're going to go to the question of duration. How long does short-term memory ask? Well, Sperling took his partial report procedure and just put in a gap, okay? So you'd see the grid very briefly again, just 50 milliseconds, which is like one frame. Uh, and then there'd be a time delay before he told you whether to report the top, the middle, or the bottom row. So we're going to uh, replicate that procedure here. So I'm going to, again, show you a grid of letters, and then I'm going to wait just a second or so before I tell you which row I want you to report the letters for. You ready? Again, students, you'll remember this better if you do the task. Okay, partial report. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Bottom. How many did you remember? It turns out that sensory memory has a very, very brief duration. It doesn't last very long at all. The graph on the right shows you the conclusion from the studies with the temporal delay. The longer the delay, the greater the loss of sensory memory. Now, why is this important? Well, it turns out this is super important to all of you who are in a relationship. I don't know about you, but with me, I'm not always great at paying attention to what my wife is saying. So sometimes when she's talking along, I'm ignoring her because I'm bad. And uh, she'll say, hey, are you paying attention? Now, I could be honest and say no. Bad idea. Honest, but hmm. What do I do? I take advantage of sensory memory. I don't fight with her. I don't disagree. I just say, what are immediately, because I know there's a little bit of information about what she was saying still in my auditory memory. So I just say whatever the words are that I remember that she just said. And nine times out of 10, I get away with it. So take advantage of sensory memory to keep you from having disputes with your partner. Works great. Okay, so just to wrap it up, we talked about three different procedures, whole report, partial report, and partial report with delay. The partial report procedure tells us that sensory memory has a very large capacity. The partial report procedure with the delay tells us that the duration of short-term memory is very, very brief. And remember I said that each of your sensory systems has a different sensory memory? We know this because they each have a different duration. So I visually, I can hang on to information in my sensory memory for about half a second. Auditorially, I can hang on. My sensory memory lasts, thankfully, longer, given the, the, um, my tendency not to pay attention and to get in trouble for it. But uh, auditory memory lasts three to four seconds. And haptic memory or touch lasts a little less than a second.